Welcome back. I still have Aaron Brehoff, body language expert, here with me. And we were just looking back at a little bit of Todd Kendhammer's testimony. And I and I was seeing exactly what you were saying, Aaron, about looking uh, as he was discussing the, the pipe coming through the windshield, uh, you know, which direction his eyes were going. Tell us a little bit more about that again. So when he so when you're recalling something, you're going to look in a, in a specific direction, left or right. Um, and it's different for every person. If you're left handed, there's a higher proportion of people that look in a different direction, but um, so he typically looks to left when he's recalling. And when he was asked a specific question about the pipe, it was the only time that it looked to the right. And that's typically when you're creating a thought, or that's what, if you're creating something, um, it's typically a deception. It's typically a deception, but it's also, there could be a reason if you're creating a thought. Let's say you're asked about somebody who you haven't seen in years, and you create them in a thought bubble, and you think about them in a thought bubble that's creating them, so you're going to look in the opposite direction, even though you're being honest about it. But this is a very specific instance that he should remember, and he looks down to the right when he says what he remembers about it. And that's because he's trying to create something, and that's something you want to dive into a little bit, because he was he that he varied from what he typically does. And so I that's think a that, that's a very that. important point, and, and I did notice just from his from his answer. Uh, during that part, it was sort of interesting to me that as they led him through uh, the accident and, and the moments directly following the accident, it was almost as if for some of the questions, he had very specific answers and a very specific recollection. And then for others, he just would say, you know, I, I have no idea. I have no idea how I turned her. I have no idea how I moved her. Um, and it, and it, it seemed at least interesting to me that his memory was sort of spotty. It's not as if he had no idea of the entire time period but these very specific moments all of a sudden were a problem for his memory. Yeah, and that's, it's a, a, any changes. So exactly what you're saying, the spottiness of things, that's, it's a really big red flag. When you have memory, no memory, memory, and it, when it's jumpy like that, it should be kind of ebb and flow, as opposed to one second he remembers, the next second he doesn't, and then he remembers the second after that. That's a, those are red flags, exactly as you say, it's, that spottiness of it is a real big red flag, and I think the prosecutors and Cross are definitely going to dive into that. Now, here's here's really what we're all thinking. You know, of course, all of us who are watching this, we want to, you know, we're looking for sort of the big picture and the little picture. So, big picture, we're looking, at, you know, did this guy do it? Um, is he going to give us an indication that he either did do it or that he didn't do it? Are we going to find him highly credible? Are we going to find him highly incredible? Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the sort of smaller pictures is. Are we going to have information that we didn't know about? What's going to what's going to come to light from his testimony that's totally new that we didn't know before? Um, but so much of this really is going to be determined on cross examination because Aaron, as you pointed out before, uh, that's really where we're going to get the real picture of of the credibility because it's not rehearsed uh, and because he will be to a degree you know on his toes during it and and he will be you know slightly off balance probably so. As you go now and, and you watch this cross-examination, what will you be looking for as a body language expert? Well, I'm going to be hoping that the prosecutor comes in and has him put his, kind of put his dukes down uh, as the uh, statement goes and have him, uh, have him be unguarded a little bit and try to talk to him, try to have some light questions first, allow him to just start having a conversation, but then allow him to talk about things. If he doesn't remember something, okay, what else does he remember around that? and have him poke holes in his own memory. So say, okay, we don't remember that specific piece. Let's talk about everything around that that you do remember. And allow him to back into kind of filling in those blanks. And I've had a number of people who have given confessions because I've said, well, okay, you don't want to talk about that specific thing. What do you want to talk about? And you allow them to go on and just speak about what they want to talk about. And eventually they end up giving too much information that they expect not to say, but then they actually do come forward with it. And hopefully if the prosecutor has some uh, good questions, it'll be something to that nature. Are there certain kinds of questions that are more likely to elicit uh, sort of stronger body language uh, cues and clues than others? You know, as a person who's an expert in this, are you watching and are you saying, well, when, well, I know when a prosecutor asks this kind of question, that's the one I really have to pay attention to body language for, or are the questions all sort of equal? I, I think it should be a slow, it should be a very slow decline or a very slow incline into those high intensity. It should move very slowly and you want to take baby steps. You want the person to feel comfortable and you don't want to ratchet up the tension 
until you really want to see, until you think they're trying to be deceptive with you, and then maybe you ratchet up the tension to have all that anxiety. You want to see all that anxiety come out because that's where you're going to see the, the high the high stress situation is where you're going to see the change in body language, which where it's going to happen very quickly. And it's going to start to be those, those jumps from, uh, those jumps of emotions. And when they, when they can't lie anymore, when they can't be deceptive anymore. And those jumps are where it get, gets really interesting. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, that we saw before is we, ha we have some still screenshots of um, uh, the facial expressions. And uh, you and I had talked about this just briefly off camera. Um, and I just want to check with our, our tech crew if we, we have that. Guys, do we have that to, to look at? Yeah, okay. So we can look at that, at that picture. And uh, Aaron, you were saying to me that that, that expression uh, does in fact indicate uh, a certain emotion. Tell me about that. Yes, and I, I think the, uh, the emotion that was shown there is fear. He, he looked, he kind of had this consistent uh, fear and surprise on his face. And it's surprising. You shouldn't have fear holding, holding strong this entire time. It should ramp down a little bit. So this is one of the things. We should see a difference in this and it should start to mellow out a little bit. And obviously, as we said before, there should be some level of fear within him for the for innocent or guilty. He should, there should be some fear. Um, but he, it was so consistent, and it seemed like he was trying to convey this so much. And there was a little, there was sadness, this same level of sadness, pretty consistently through. And it was really odd to see, you know, no change in that emotion. Well, it should. If you're talking about the good times, he still had this look of fear in his face when he's talking about how he. Um, you know, loved his wife for 25 years in this over-the-top expression of love, but he still had this look of fear. Um, and that, it's just a surprising, you don't expect to hear that. So as this direct goes on, does that emotion start to ramp down a little bit? Or does he have, is it faint? Is it faint and is he doing this on purpose? And then on cross, what's, is that emotion going to change or is he going to continuously do this, this same faint look of fear, you know, for another two, three hours, or if it goes on for days. And let me just ask you, Aaron, so when you're saying, when you're looking at that picture and you're saying that this is a look of fear, um, you know, when I saw Todd Kenhammer sit down, the first thing I said is, oh my goodness, this guy has that deer in headlights kind of look with his eyes wide open. You can see the whites of his eyes on the top and on the bottom as, a, you know, as opposed to just on the sides like usual. Um, and now it's of course possible that's just the way this guy looks all the time. But tell me, what are you looking at to say, this body language is the body language of fear. What are the signs? So fear is, uh, it's the, the whites of the eyes exactly. You're gonna see that, you're gonna see the raised brow. brow, And uh, it's, so you're looking at a few different points in the face, a few different action units. And this, this technology, and you saw that picture with the percentage, it actually picks up percentage based upon how he looks when he's uh, without, it, without um, with kind of no emotion on his face. And then you see when he uh, when he's responding about these things, you see his eyes are opening, his brows are coming up, in into the center a little bit, and you see these different action units um, occurring, and they're occurring at a relatively the same rate continuously, and that's where it's surprising. So he'll listen, and he'll still have that look of fear on him. So maybe it, it could be potentially that he's a little bit. Um, that's how he looks pretty consistently. The deer in headlights, as you put it. <laughs> um, you know, maybe that maybe this guy has been that way his entire life, and. Anytime he's speaking, he has that deer in headlights look. So, uh, I doubt we'll see that on cross, though. Really? Okay. So th that's one of the things I want to talk to you about. So now, you know, you're kind of uh, deputized to make us all, you know, body language experts for the next couple of hours. And what I would love is is for you to give us kind of some tips about as we, you know, as we move toward cross examination. Um, I don't know exactly when it's going to be, but I assume it will be relatively soon. Uh, what will you be looking at? What can we as viewers watch? And, and what are those signs and what will they mean? So, you know, you've talked about uh, the looking down and to the side and up and to the side and, and that. In addition to that, what else? I'm sure that's not the only body language trick you have. So I, uh, give, us, give us some more insider tips. Well, you can open up, uh, I'll plug my app right here, Smirky. You can you plug in the uh, Smirky app and you can actually watch the emotions in real time. You can take a video um, using any
expert. We're talking about uh, things to look for as we get to the, the end of the direct examination, as we move on to the cross-examination. So, so for starters, there's that, that quick change in emotion because the, the, the quickness is not what we would expect. We would expect a more gradual change of emotion. Um, I like, uh, and that Smirky app I think is great. And that's your app. app is that right, Aaron? Yes, it's my, my company has developed that app. for it's, The Smirk app is a social app, and we're also developing it for people on the spectrum as well to help them. So a little bit, a few different apps, but that's a, a social app. And it's more, uh, more of a fun app, but it's, uh, it can tell emotions uh, real time, and you can FaceTime with it, do a number of things with it. But it's real-time emotional recognition. Well, it seems like it could certainly be great fun for trial watchers and those of us uh, really analyzing witnesses on the stand uh, and, and really to kind of take it to the next level to analyze what we're watching and what we should make of it. Uh, and, and so so we've talked about that change in motion. What else? Are there, are there gestures? Are there facial expressions? Are there um, non-facial bodily movements that, that are meaningful to you that you're specifically looking out for? Or is it sort of a big picture that you're always looking for? Definitely a big picture. But one of the things that, that are really interesting is when someone says um, they're absolutely certain about something, but they're shrugging their shoulders. That's like, hmm, I don't know. Like if you say, I don't know, and you shrug your shoulders, that's typically what they, they correlate. It's something that's congruent. But when you said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certain of this, but they're not certain of it. They're shrugging their shoulders. Um, but really, you have to, two things. You have to take the baseline, and then you look for a few things within that baseline. So does he normally shrug his shoulders when he doesn't know something? Okay. Well, then you can take that and move it forward. But that's a really big indicator when they're shrugging their shoulders and they have no clue about something. Um, as long as that's their typical baseline, but that's usually something I look for. And then if there's if they're very certain about something, but they're shaking their head right and left, um, if that's not their typical baseline, and they're yes, I absolutely believe this. I absolutely <laughs> believe in what I'm talking about. It's just weird. It's not something you typically do. Um, it's not something a typical person does. And if that's not something that he typically does, that's something to watch for. So you take his baseline, and then you put that again, and then you put that against how he's going to act. And it's uh, but shaking of the head. Um, eye direct, eye movement, a shoulder shrug is usually, it's a really easy indicator to see. And then another thing is uh, when you ramp up tension and there's uh, the blink rate and the change in blink rate. So if the tension is at the same level and then the blink rate, blink rate instantly changes, it changes very, um, very quickly, there's a reason for that. And you need to understand why, there's a re why they're blinking at a different rate. It's a really easy indicator that people don't, aren't usually able to change. And it's not that people that blink more line or people that blink lesser line, it's that when it changes, something has changed. And if there's not a, it's not because it's a wind is in their eye and it's not because of a question that was just asked, then it's because they're changing something within their own, within their own head. Maybe that's deception, maybe that's truth. So the blink rate, that I think that, I, I, I love talking about that because that is an easy thing to look at uh, as someone who is a non-expert, but just someone who's casually watching this testimony, um, just to look back at what a person had been doing versus what they're doing now. Um, does increased blink rate indicate increased anxiety? Is that how that works? So it's, a lot of people think if you're looking away or you're blinking a lot, you're being deceptive. But that thought now has changed it. So if you think, oh, if I make, a lot of times, uh, you know, your five-year-old kid, if you ask him, you know, did you eat the can did you eat that last piece of the candy bar? They're going to look down and away, and they're going to twist their foot. But now they've realized that people realize that that's an indicator of deception. So what they do is they try to make more eye contact, and they try to stop blinking, and they try to get much more connected with you. So it's the change. It's simply the change. It's not necessarily linked one way or the other because people know about it, because people know that this something we're looking for. It's now something that's uh, that's changing, and you have to look for the difference in it. But typically a higher, if you're a little bit more intense, if you're not thinking about it, you're probably going to blink a little bit more. Now, now, Aaron, let me ask you, as you're talking about this, it, it would strike me that it would be uh, very helpful uh, to a witness to potentially have consulted with somebody like you or to have thought a little bit about body language. Um, you know, going into the testimony. So are these things, uh, you know, where one looks or how we blink or, uh, you know, something like shrugging when we're, when we're nodding or something like that, are those things that if you wanted to, you could change? It is. So that's exactly what I'm saying with the, uh, the child that looks down in a way. 
that it yeah. changes now. People are looking at making more eye contact when they're lying. So it's the change. So it's really, you can think about all this stuff. I've actually become a worse liar because of my knowledge of this. Because <laughs> I realize I'm giving a tell. I'm like, wait, stop. Don't give that tell. And then I do this weird robot move where I, I stop and I freeze. So it's, it's something you can change. It's something that people do train on. But it's, uh, it's always going to come out. And that's why it's about the change. It's not about one specific move. So maybe they're going to, okay, they're going to hold their hands. They're not going to make their hands move. I had a, uh, I worked with the, the head of white collar crimes from the FBI for a while. And one of the things he would do for his, uh, do for people, who, for his secondary interviewers that weren't trained in deception, weren't trained in body language or anything like that, is he would put a clicky pen on a table. So the, inter the person he was interviewing would click the pen. And when there was a change in the amount that he clicked the pen, it's very easy to hear the clicky pen going. When there is a change, you need to understand why there's a change. And not necessarily more clicks are mean deception or less clicks mean deception. It means there's a change. And if you can't explain that with the line of questioning, then you need to dive more into those questions around the change. Well, this has been so helpful and so informative. And I think that for all of us that uh, you know, enjoy watching the legal system unfold and enjoy watching testimony. Uh, I, I think that this is going to add a really interesting layer to what we take away. Uh, you know, not just the words, not just the questions and the answers, not just the evidence, but rather kind of the unspoken part of this whole of this kind of whole exercise of trials. And uh, and Aaron, I really thank you for being with us today. This has been incredibly interesting. I hope you'll come back again. Uh, you know, maybe later in this trial, but certainly for other trials, and we can dissect who's lying and where they're looking and what their eyes are doing. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating and I really enjoyed having you here. Absolutely, thank you for having me, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much.